joining us on the Aquarium of Niagara's live Facebook feed today. Today we're talking about our electric eel. So Lance, can you tell us a little bit about this specific electric eel? How long have we had him here? Well, we've had this guy here about 15 years, and I say guy because if you take a good look at him, you see he's kind of orange in the front. And uh, the males, as they get mature, they will be much uh, brighter under their bellies and under their heads. Um, they get a bright orange, and he's starting that now. So that's how you can tell males from females. You know, it's pretty cool right now. He looks like he's going up to take a gulp of air. I, I don't think yeah. I've ever seen fish do that. Well, there are other fish that can do that, but he has to do that. Okay, electric eels do not have well-developed gills. So what they, what they have... Uh, cells in their mouths that absorb oxygen and so they get most of their oxygen out of their mouths and they have to come up to breathe air actually they gulp air every about 15 minutes if they don't they can actually drown that's crazy we definitely wouldn't want this guy drowning now say you know something did happen to him and we had to get in the tank to to help him is there any special precautions that we need to take with an electric eel well electric eels are called electric eels because they can shock you and they can shock up to 650 volts which is a lot of voltage so you don't want to just reach out and touch one but what we have are protective gloves rubber gloves that we can put on and they can um, their arm length and so if we ever need to handle or move the animal all we have to do is put those rubber gloves on to, to catch him and move him to another exhibit if we have to or do whatever we have to do for working with him so we're safe um, but you have to remember that he is an electric eel um, and, that's and he is electric so you don't want to just touch one now I did see him just bump into that log like he wasn't you know able to see where he was going do those little tiny eyes like do they work very well for him actually when they're babies they do have well-developed eyes but as they grow their eyes get cataracts on them you'll notice that they are kind of cloudy looking as you swam by so what they have is a well-developed electrical system they have three organs uh, um, in their bodies the sacs hunts and, and main organ and what they do is all those have little specific purposes and one of the organs will help him navigate so he puts out an electromagnetic field around himself and it comes bounces off objects and comes back to him and that helps him see everything that's around him which helps them in the wild because they're found in very murky um, waters in the wild usually shallow water because they have to come up and breathe but they uh, use that magnetic field to maneuver around and it's as good as eyesight it's better than eyesight than fish in the water that depend on their eyes he can move around really well um, and better than them and he can find them with that magnetic field that's what he uses it for also and then he can catch his prey so that's a very well developed sense for them so you said now he can use that electric field that he emits out into the water to catch his prey. Does that hurt the prey at all, or does it just help him find them? Well, he's able to put out different um, varying degrees of voltage. That's a very low voltage. Um, it could probably be go up to about 10 volts for him to do that. Um, but he has the main organ on him. If you take a look at his body, three quarters of his body, just behind his pectoral fins, which are those side fins. Um, are all the main electric organ. So that's what he uses to stun his prey. That's what generates the 650 volts. But the Saxon Hunter organs also aid in his navigation. Okay, so that's um, where those come into play. Um, so he's well equipped to both uh, stun his prey and maneuver around. That's cool. So what does this guy eat usually? Okay, he is a carnivore, so he'll eat any kind of fish. Um, invertebrates, uh, even small mammals, because one thing about these electric eels are they, they can, the, the record for an electric eel is over nine feet long, so that's a really big animal, so they can take really big prey. So they can eat small mammals, they can eat, um, they can eat fish, which is their main source of food, and invertebrates that they find along the bottom. Okay, so that's generally what they will eat. That's great. Now, if anybody has any questions, feel free to shoot us a, a comment, and we'd love to answer them. But uh, just a few more questions for you, Lance, if you don't mind. Um, why do we only see one eel in this tank? Do they like to be alone? Well, it varies according to the size of the, uh, the size of the exhibits that you have and the male to female ratio. Males tend to fight um, as, as they mature. So, so basically you need a very large tank and you will see them displayed in larger exhibits um, in groups, but even then they will fight. But um, because of the size of the exhibit, which is fine for him, it's all he needs. Um, we don't want to put another animal in though because they may start getting territorial and start fighting. That's great, that's great. Now, believe it or not, we have some more Amazonian species that we're going to show you today. Not just our electric eel, but we have a few more exhibits right behind us that we can kind of show you that there's some smaller 
um, animals that live in the Amazon as well. And some of them are little fish like this that are called cardinal tetras. We have some rummy nose tetras in here. And hiding in our driftwood that unfortunately you can't see, we do have some Corridor's catfish. So um, like I was saying, these are the smaller animals that you would find down in those river basins um, being these are tetras. So just a little smaller. And these are some fish that those electric eels might snack on throughout their day too. What is the Project Piaba that they're part of, Alyssa? That's a great question. So Project Piaba is known as a way to help protect the rainforest. So pretty much there are a whole economy of people down in South America that will pull these fish from the waters and then sell those to um, facilities around the world to help sustain the population in their natural environment too. So pretty much you motivate the residents to protect their natural landscape and help those fish uh, thrive as well. Great question. Now, not only do we have these little tiny guys down in the Amazon, we also have some adorable puffers. Um, so this exhibit's brand new, so they're still getting um, the hang of, of, you know, how they interact with each other, but these are Amazon puffers. Um, they will pretty much stay this size, won't, won't get too much bigger, maybe about three to three inches, but uh, they like some live plants in there, a lot of different places to hide, and they like a lot of movement, so you'll see them kind of zooming through the water. Why do they call them puffer fish? Puffers, that's a great question. So they can actually puff up. So they're known to actually, you know, suck in kind of that water and um, inflate themselves almost to make themselves look, um, you know, big and, and mean in case a predator was coming to try and eat them. <laughs> so those are our Amazon puffers. We'd love to take you back over to our electric eel and finish off our segment. Actually, I changed my mind. We're going to look at some dart frogs because we're passing anyway. So this is our dart frog exhibit. It is a little overgrown because frogs like to hide uh, in the, the trees and under moss and all that. We do have a couple up on the rocks back there on the ledge. Um, so dart frogs are, uh, these are considered poison dart frogs. They are not poisonous um, in captivity because you can feed them certain foods that will not uh, let them you know, emit that poison through their skin. Um, so they're completely okay to handle. Um, they, like I said, they do like to hide. Uh, they're little tiny frogs, so they usually are hiding under the moss and, and into the trees and stuff to keep themselves safe throughout the day. Um, so not in the water, but these are kind of your terrestrial animals that you would see in the Amazon. recommend keeping one as I said um, this is actually um, almost three feet long um, and that's actually not even its full growth potential the average size is three to six feet for an electric eel which is way too large for most home aquariums the fact that they can give you a serious shock um, is another reason not to keep them um, they have been known to drown people they've been known to stun horses in the wild um, so that's a very good reason not to keep them um, just enjoy them at, at the uh, aquarium in Niagara um, they're an amazing animal. It's just another example of how amazing differences we find in animals, that um, how they adapt to their environments. Um, it's a very strong adaption for them. There's not too many things that will tangle with them in the wild. Um, caimans have been known to be uh, grab them and, and, and actually be killed by them in the wild by the shock. So um, it's just an amazing animal. Um, it's really interesting to um, think that that they exist. There's also other types of electric fish I do want to mention that we don't have here, but there's an electric catfish in, uh, in Africa. Um, there's also electric rays in the ocean. So the electric eel is not the only electric fish. Um, there are smaller fish that use electricity. Um, mormorids they're called. Um, elephant noses in the pet shops. If you go to a pet shop, um, they sell those. That they, they have a really good electrical system for navigation like the electric eel, but they're not capable of shocking you. But, um, but they also use their electrical navigation to get around. So the electric eel is not unique in its electrical um, properties, but it is interesting to note that it's only water animals that are, have the ability to produce electrical shocks. That's great. And that's because of the medium. Well, to end our day with joining us, we really appreciate it. If you wouldn't mind visiting our website back here with us to 
check out some extracurricular activities that have to do with the electric eel, just so you can, you know, um, increase your knowledge and educate yourself a little bit, have a little fun with the rest of your day. If you have any questions, we'd love to answer them, but other than that, we'll see you tomorrow for our 2 p.m. show.